on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome Lena Khan. She is a reporter and policy analyst at the New America Foundation. And her latest piece, How Corporations Became People You Can't Sue, is at the Washington Monthly. Welcome to the program, Lena. Thank you. Uh, now, I, I have, uh, in uh, full disclosure, uh, I have uh, a particular interest in these types of stories, uh, not the least of which because I see the uh, immense importance of civil litigation in supplementing our government's regulatory uh, authority. And uh, I do a program, uh, uh, at least on the weekends, with uh, Mike Papantonio, who is one of the country's largest um, uh, plaintiff's attorneys, trial lawyers, if you like. Uh, and uh, you know, when the AT&T story uh, first came out, a ruling, I guess, back in 2011, we talked about it quite a bit. But uh, let's uh, uh, your piece really broadens this out. And uh, so let, let's start with the example of Target, because uh, this, I think, a, a, and your your juxtaposition of what happened with Target and what would be the same situation now if it happened, let's say, with Amazon, I think is very uh, uh, illustrative of, of, of what we're, we're looking at now. Right, exactly. So as we all know, you know, there was this big uh, data hack at Target last year. Um, you know, it had really bad security, and as a result, you know, thousands and thousands of customers had their personal data stolen, and the ramifications of that were huge. As a result of that, a lot of consumers banded together and sued Target. Um, and, you know, there's there are all these class action lawsuits, and they're being consolidated, and so now a public judge is going to hear the case. Uh, we're all going to see, you know, what documents come out of it. The evidence is going to be public, and we're all going to, you know, be able to see whether justice gets done. Um, if the exact same thing happened at Amazon, which, by the way, has you know far more customers and, and credit card information, it has like 230 million um, customer accounts. If the exact same thing happened at Amazon, the result would be radically different. So, because of these uh, recent Supreme Court cases, Amazon has inserted something in its contract called a binding arbitration clause, coupled with a class ban. So as a result, if anything happened to consumers, they would not be able to sue Amazon in a traditional sense, nor would they be able to band together. So if any of us you know, had a grievance against Amazon, if our bank accounts were wiped clean because of you know, insecure um, data protection, we would instead have to resort to a private arbitrator that would be chosen by Amazon. Um, you know, none of the evidence would end up being public. Um, there would be no public record of what happened. So it's just a situation in which you see that these court cases have emboldened companies to insert certain terms in their contracts that are leading to drastically different outcomes. And we should say, obviously, Amazon is not alone in this. Uh, we're just using them as an example. And we should also say that when we talk about contracts, what we are ultimately talking about is just that little button that you click on and say, I agree, uh, which none of us ever read uh, when we, we, we sign up for these things. So let's, let's talk about um, AT&T versus uh, Concepcion, uh, and then we'll get to the American Express uh, case. Um, because uh, those were the ones that I think. Well, actually, let's let's go back in in history a little bit and and, and talk about you talk about the sort of um, uh, how the idea of of civil torts sort of made its way into our law and what and and what pro purpose it serves. So let's go back as to when we we first saw these in history. Sure. So, you know, in America's legal tradition, our right to sue was essentially born of a deep skepticism of concentrated power. So, you know, we recognized early on that if we only relied on government to protect our legal rights, that would leave us massively exposed, partly because, you know, government officials are so vulnerable to being corrupt and being bought up by powerful interests. So the idea that all Americans should have the right to sue was, yeah, basically just a way to guarantee that, you know, the laws that were passed, we would actually be able to enforce. Um, so that was the thinking, and, you know, we see it enshrined in, say, the Seventh Amendment, uh, which, you know, gives us the right to a jury trial. Um, and, yeah, there's, you know, an ancient tradition that basically says if individuals have the right to sue, you're going to see laws be enforced uh, more rigorously. 
Um, and then we saw, you know, in the 19th century, um, in the late 19th century, we started seeing more court cases, partly because we saw, you know, corporate activity rise. And so Congress in 1925 passed something called the Federal Arbitration Act, which basically recognized a limited use of arbitration, essentially as a way for businesses and business partners to speedily resolve disputes. So, you know, we started seeing the courts, court cases um rise and you didn't want to always be caught up in that queue. And it's really important to note that at that time, you know, a lot of congressmen were very skeptical of this thing called arbitration. And they were very aware that if it was used in the wrong way between, say, parties of unequal bargaining power, it would essentially uh, eviscerate rights. So, you know, they were very wary and they passed it basically so that it could, it could only be used between parties of equal uh, bargaining power, so essentially businesses or business partners, um, in contracts, you know, rather than, say, arbitration. They, they emphasize that arbitration should not be something that was used to determine the outcome of laws. It would really only be used to settle contracts. Um, and that's really how it worked for, you know, decades. And then in the eight, 1980s, we started seeing... Be, before we get to the 1980s, I, I want to just touch on that last part that you said, uh, that arbitration should be used to dispute, um, um, uh, to, to, should be used to resolve disputes as opposed to interpret laws. What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically... You know, if you and I have written a contract together, you know, we are, we're both coming to the table with more or less equal bargaining power, and we have written a contract, and then say, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks, you do something that I think has violated that contract, we can go to an arbitrator and ask the arbitrator to interpret our contract, the document that you and I wrote. That's very different from, say, if, you know, I am your employee and I think you stole wages from me or, you know, are, are discriminating against me and I think you broke the law. And then if you and I go to an arbitrator that you chose and are asking the arbitrator to interpret the law. So, you know, it's very different to ask somebody to interpret a document, a contract that you and I wrote versus interpret the law. And what we're now, what we've now allowed arbitration to become, is basically a way for private judges to rule on public law, which is really not anything that arbitration was intended for. And 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 I want to also, uh, before we start to 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 talk about how this um, this concept has been sort of mutated, particularly by the courts, uh, the Supreme Court, we should just uh, mention as well that. Um, that uh, the idea of individual plaintiffs um, sort of supplementing, I guess, uh, the enforcement role uh, of government bureaucracies can be seen in uh, statutes that allow for uh, triple damages um, uh, for plaintiffs, like in, 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 in both, I guess, uh, tort suits and in a antitrust suits. I mean, this was a way of, I mean, Congress was essentially saying, and, and when, when I say, uh, saying that we're, we're talking about, uh, back in the 1800s, even Congress was saying that we understand the vital role that the civil procedures, um, can, can play in in a in supplementing our regulatory powers exactly exactly and they actually work in tandem you know so some of the biggest um you know suits that we've seen over the last few decades that were ultimately brought by the government actually drew a whole lot of material from private cases. So, you know, some of the biggest, the huge tobacco settlement that grew out of thousands of, of private cases, you know, even more recently, some of the big cases against Bank of America, those, the material for that case that the government brought stemmed from private cases. And I think that's actually one of the most dangerous things about arbitration is that it privatizes all this information. So one of the great things about public courts is that all the information that comes out is accessible for everybody to see. With arbitrators, even if a company admits that it's done wrong, none of that information is accessible to anybody else. So, you know, a government wouldn't be able to say, look at a case and be like, oh, this looks like it actually affected thousands or millions of people. Um, so I think the way in which arbitration is actually even probably diminishing the ability of government to bring cases is huge. And, and, and let's talk about that in the context of the, uh, the tobacco settlement, because, and just uh, for, for the sake of people who are not familiar with how these, uh, these tort cases go, uh, talk just briefly, like when we say about evidence coming public, even if the case is lost, there are 
there are reams of documents that are exposed in the context of, of depositions and in discovery uh, 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 phase of a case that can then be built upon later. Like you say, the, the Bank of America case, I think that um, uh, w was brought by, um, uh, by the New York uh, Attorney General, I think it was that case, was very much founded upon uh, documents and evidence that, w that came out in the course of, of, of multiple uh, uh, private um, uh, suits. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the tobacco um, one is a great example because plaintiffs filed over 800 suits against tobacco companies and pretty much lost all of them over a course of 40 years. But even though they lost them, what it ended up doing was build, bringing reams of internal documents from companies into the public domain. So even though individuals lost, it, it gave public enforcers enough material um, so that state attorneys general ended up filing a much, much, much bigger and much stronger case and ended up, you know, getting a $206 billion settlement um, that also ended up imposing, you know, huge changes across the industry. And, you know, as you mentioned, that the big case against uh, Bank of America and, uh, and other big banks about wrongful uh, mortgage foreclosure um, is another example where we saw, you know, a lot of private documents come in the public domain through private cases. And we see this also in the context of pharmaceutical cases. We see this in the context of environmental cases where uh, uh, government regulation becomes, uh, the, uh, at the very least, part of the basis of these private, uh, of these private suits. And so there is, a, um, there is sort of a, a symbiotic relationship between these things. Exactly, exactly. And I think it should also be said that, you know, in, in many instances, you don't actually even have to sue. I mean, one of the things is that the threat of litigation can often be a really powerful deterrent. So if a company knows that, you know, it could be faced with a huge suit, um, a lot of publicity, or a lot of uh, its documents being uh, revealed, that, that acts as a powerful deterrent. And I think one of, yeah, the most insidious things is that corporations are just essentially becoming immunized from, from swaths of the law. Um, um, and just what that does psychologically, what that does in terms of, you know, whether they're even discouraged from breaking laws, from abusing their power in the first place, I think that's something we should also really think about. And, and I would add to that, before we go into the sort of the court cases that have sort of diminished this uh, ability, that when you are facing the potential of a jury award, uh, it's far less predictable in terms of the size than it would be if you were just looking at a uh, a government fine, right? I mean, and that that uh, increases the, uh, the sort of the self policing effect uh, on corporations uh, when they come to decide. You know, we're going to cut this corner, we're going to cut that corner um, uh, in terms of consumer or workplace safety, because you know, at the end of the day, if we have to pay a government fine, that's just sort of the cost of doing business, and we can make that cost benefit analysis right there. Whereas if we don't, if we if we have trouble anticipating what a jury award could be, uh, because people sometimes are far more sensitive to uh, these type of shenanigans than than the government would be, um, uh, that that impacts the behavior of these corporations extensively. Exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, what arbitration also does is it, it lets you just pay off kind of individual by individual. So if, you know, if, if every individual is supposed to bring its own arbitration case, it lets you just factor that into just as a cost of business, but kind of continue, you know, screwing people over at large. Whereas if you had a class action or a bigger government case, um, it would kind of er eradicate the practice entirely. So that's another way in which, you know, allowing companies to just build this in as a cost of business rather having to you know, step up um, in the public court makes a really big difference. So let's go back to 1983, uh, Moses Cohn versus Mercury Construction. Uh, why is that uh, case important uh, when we talk about the, this, uh, I guess, slow dissolution of our rights to sue corporations? Right. So that was an important case because it was one of the first ones in which we started seeing kind of the Supreme Court take this really strange turn. Um, so that was a case in which arbitration wasn't even the, the central issue at play. 
But what happened was in the decision, uh, Justice Brennan, uh, who was actually a leader of the court's liberal wing, wrote an opinion that basically said that the Federal Arbitration Act reflected what he called a federal policy favoring arbitration. Now, those four words, which at the time, you know, weren't weren't such a big deal, ended up having massive ramifications because what he was saying essentially was that Congress had intended arbitration to be preferable to courts. This is something that doesn't really exist in the legislative history at all. He basically just said, you know, where in cases where you're deciding between arbitration and courts, Congress prefers arbitration. Um, so that was kind of the first step where he just created this language that subsequent judges would rely on heavily. Um, and in the next couple of years, we, we started seeing this kind of spiral out of control. So there was another case the following year uh, where Congress, you know, uh, when the judges again used Brennan's language about, you know, this federal policy favoring arbitration. Um, and then we started seeing another case in 1985 um, in which they basically said the arbitration could be used to apply to antitrust laws. Um, and the, the two, yeah, the few, the big changes here were that basically arbitration went from being something that was used between parties of equal bargaining power to determine contracts to being able to use between, you know, routine contracts with, say, consumers or employees to determine law. So I think that's, you know, where we started seeing the slippery slope um, and, and the judges basically created, massively expanded the ways in which arbitration could be used. Do you have a sense, I mean, uh, uh, you know, your piece makes it pretty clear that that the uh, intent of the, um, uh, of the Federal Arbitration Act uh, was not to supplant uh, courts, but to, to do, as you say, you know, to deal with sort of business to business uh, disputes that uh, really centered around the document they had created in between them, the, the agreement they had created in, in between them. I mean, do, do you have a sense of, of, you know, because we we uh, like to think, uh, obviously, uh, William Brennan was a um, uh, was considered a, a like you say, a liberal leader of the court. I mean, what do we have a sense of what the motivation was uh, behind his his perception of that uh, congressional intent? Yeah, you know the opinions on this vary wildly. I mean, it's just a really it's just a really baffling series of decisions. It's just like starting in the eighties, um, you know, just start reading this law in a way that is just grotesquely out of line with the legislative history. And, you know, there's been a lot of scholarship that, that identifies that and makes that case. I mean, it should be said that these cases uh, were determined um, against the backdrop of a huge, a bit, a huge movement for, for tort reform right. and the kind of the rise of the Chicago school way of thinking about the law and the role of government in relation to, you know, corporate power and, and, and businesses. Um, and so, you know, it would be naive to think that these things were somehow totally disconnected when there was this radical shift going on about, you know, viewing how government should have a much more limited role in policing companies. I mean, walk me through this Mitsubishi um, uh, Solar Chrysler uh, Plymouth case. This is the one where it really makes that hard turn. And I, I, I still, I mean, it's, as presented, it really, I, I just have question marks all over that, that, that paragraph because <laughs> it really is stunning. Walk us through that, and, 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 and how is this possible? Right, right. So as you said, you know, this is a case where there was, it was an antitrust case between uh, Mitsubishi and this company, Solar Chrysler. Um, and, you know, antitrust laws are federal laws. And so it was a clear case where, you know, Mitsubishi was pushing to arbitrate and the other company was saying, hey, hold up, this is a law, you can't use arbitration for laws. Um, and, you know, the court ended up siding with Mitsubishi uh, by a five justice majority. But importantly, in this case, they, they introduced something called if, the effective vindication doctrine, which basically says, yes, arbitration can be used to determine laws, except when the use of arbitration stops people from being able to effectively vindicate their laws. So it was basically kind of, you know, leaving the safety valve where it was saying, okay, you can use arbitration but if it seems like arbitration is actually, you know, distorting the law or distorting your right to be able to, you know, hold up your rights, then arbitration is not valid. And that's what was really radical about the 2013 American Express case, um, where basically the court said that even when, even when arbitration is precluding you from bringing your case, we're still going to uphold it. And so that was kind of this watershed moment where you saw this, you know, tiny, 
albeit feeble, but perhaps, you know, still a provision in, in the Mitsubishi case that was kind of giving us uh, a, a way to still, you know, bring our bring our uh, rights to court. And in, in 2013, the, the Supreme Court did away with even that. All right. I want to come back to that case. But first, I want to talk about uh, this um this idea, uh, the, the, the case of AT&T versus Concepcion, because that, uh, I mean, that to me was one of those cases that uh, gets very, very little attention uh, in any media, as far as I could tell, uh, but particularly any type of mass media. But it had such huge implications because it struck at the heart of why why um, class action suits are are so invaluable to consumers because for 32 bucks or whatever it was no one's going to do anything about this uh but when you have hundreds of thousands of people who pay uh, you know get get basically robbed of 32 bucks or whatever it was then all of a sudden you'll see some type of of action so so walk us through this AT&T uh Concepcion case Sure. So this was a case that, you know, as you mentioned, the Supreme Court heard in 2011. Uh, it was brought by this couple, the Concepcion's, who had sued AT&T in California because the company had engaged in, you know, all this deceptive advertising um, and essentially had shortchanged millions of consumers out of around $30 each. So it's something that, you know, it's not it's not like a massive, egregious thing that is, you know, depriving people of, like, deep fundamental rights, but it's still something that a corporation is just, you know, milking money out of consumers just because it has the power to. So what they tried to do was they tried to litigate as a class. They, you know, found all these other people who had also um, been shortchanged and tried to band together. What happened was AT&T in their contract had inserted something called a class ban that prohibited consumers from coming together. Now, California, along with many other states, had just prohibited these kinds of class bans. They recognized that, you know, class action bans basically would preclude people from bringing any cases. And so they said, nope, companies can't insert this. What the Supreme Court ended up doing was saying that those they, they basically overturned those state laws. They said they upheld AT&T's right to to insert class bans, which is important also just as a, you know, it's there's a huge there's a huge state rights argument to be made here because ultimately you're you're seeing um, what the Supreme Court is allowing companies to do is override state laws that have tried to protect their own citizens. So, you know, you're, you you do see in a way in which this is really hurting just the ability of states to to make laws and uphold their own laws. I mean, the, the this is uh, so so the people understand. I mean, this analogy is a little bit uh, crude on some level, and obviously maybe maybe uh, you know when we when we look at the idea of thirty dollars, it's not the the same stakes for the individual, but this is essentially saying you still have a right to sue uh, uh, AT&T, but just not in a way that really you can practically do it. This is basically saying, like, uh, abortion's legal, but we're going to outlaw every abortion clinic, um, you know, for uh, the next, uh, you know, 2,000 miles, uh, you know, from uh, from where you live. And, and so w- could there be a federal law? I mean, in other words, would the state, would, would, would the Supreme Court have upheld a federal statute that said you can't have uh, class action bans, or no? Uh, my guess is no, but you know, given how grossly they've expanded the reading, you know, it's it's anybody's guess. Um, so yeah, I mean, thankfully it hasn't it hasn't come to you know that being tested. But I think yeah, I think it is going to take some kind of congressional action to kind of reassert the idea that arbitration was really only intended to be used in these really isolated circumstances. Or you know there are instances in which say workers or consumers might choose to arbitrate. There are cases in which it makes sense to arbitrate. The the idea that companies should be able to foist these upon us in these contracts that aren't even really contracts. It's not like we're sitting down with AT and T or American Express and deciding the terms of this agreement. They're they're just being handed to us. So, you know, these are not contracts, and they're being imposed on us by parties with immense market power, with immense bargaining power. And so the idea that, you know, this should be able, this effectively is just able to erode our our ability to bring our cases, uh, uphold our rights, is just a really big deal. Yeah, and and, and people should understand that there is, in fact, a, a legal 
uh, principle of 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 terms in a contract being so onerous or so one sided as to being uh, specifically called unconscionable. Um, just just um, explicate that for us a little bit so that people understand it's not just a question of. Uh, you can't just, you know, that uh, you're two people entering a contract that's completely free to do it, that there is a legal concept that you can theoretically enter a contract that is that is so one sided that it is it is unconscionable and cannot be upheld. Just uh, I mean, uh, have I expressed that properly? I, I think you did a great job. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there is this legal term called unconscionable that describes contracts that so favor the party with the superior bargaining power that it's considered unjust. I mean, it's considered not even a contract because it's something that's just being imposed on you rather than you agreeing to it. So, yeah, that's exactly right. This legal concept already exists. But in this instance, we're seeing how, you know, the courts are not really paying attention to it. And, and that was a that uh, that AT&T case was a 5-4 split. And that uh, that becomes sort of the um, uh, the I guess the 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 new watershed really is that we're seeing uh, these uh, last cases which are are snuffing out uh, our ability to uh, to to bring these type of of class actions uh, is, is seems to be falling on a five four split and that takes us to that American Express case. I mean I, I know you've just you you've 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 described it, but. Uh, we still had that concept going into the American Express case that if it's the only way uh, you could bring a case um, that um, that ban on class actions wouldn't stand. Now, I, I, I don't understand. Well, it, I don't understand how that wasn't in effect in the context of the California case, because you can't go in. It's just not practical for someone to go in for $32, right? I mean, it's just not practical uh, to take this case up uh, because, you know, no lawyer is going to take that case. Um, mm -hmm. And even if it's uh, above, let's say, uh, what a, uh, you know, a small claims court would do, it, it's still, in many respects, not practical to go up a, a, a against a corporation of that size who particularly might not want a precedent set. Um, and they're going to throw everything at you, and it's just the, the the it's just so unbalanced at that point. But in this uh, American Express case, just uh, walk us through uh, the the case of Italian Colors. Sure. So this is a case brought by this guy called Alan Carlson, who owns an Italian restaurant um, in California. And he had been doing business with American Express. Um, what American Express had been doing was it started introducing these new cards with much higher fees and was kind of tying its products together in a way that was forcing him, because he was taking one card, to take you know, many other ones with much more onerous terms. So that's, you know, considered for the most part a, a violation of antitrust laws. So he tried to bring an antitrust case. Antitrust cases are now extremely expensive to bring because they require a lot of economic analysis, a lot of kind of expertise. Um, and it's just essentially impossible for you to bring one in case you're, you know, unless you have a lot of money or unless you're able to kind of band together with other people. So he found other independent businesses who had also, you know, been subject to these terms with American Ex from Exper American Express and tried to band together. American Express pointed to this class action ban um, in his contract. He came back and pointed out, hey, you know, unless I band together as a class, we have no way to even bring this case because it's so expensive. And so that's the case that the Supreme Court ended up hearing and ended up ruling that, you know, even though – your, your inability to band together as a class means that you can't bring this case, we're still going to uphold the class action ban. And it was really, I mean, it's, just, it's amazing to read because the judges are essentially, the majority of the court is essentially saying these laws, it's okay for these rights to only exist in theory. Yes, these laws exist on the book and they give you these rights, but it's okay if you can, you know, just point to them on paper, but you can't bring them in court, you can't effectively vindicate them, that's okay. And it was just really radical, um, a really radical decision. And, you know, the, the, the dissent written by Elena Kagan was fantastic. She really got to the heart of it. I mean, what she said, and this is a quote, she says, this means the monopolist gets to use its monopoly power to insist on a contract effectively depriving its victims of all legal recourse. And here is the nutshell version of today's opinion, admirably flaunted rather than camouflaged, too darn ba bad. 
So what she's basically saying is that we're empowering monopolies not only to impose these impose these terms on us, but we're also giving them the, the ability to just get away with, you know, abusing their market power. Um, so it's just kind of this, you know, double protection for them. And so the courts acknowledge that, look, this may be the only, uh, a class action may be the only um, practical way for you to bring this case, but we don't care. Uh, this, this arbitration clause trumps all. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, it's just, it's kind of just, it's it's a perfect culmination of this trend uh, where we've basically just been seeing the court uh, eliminate eliminate courts uh, as a way for ordinary Americans to bring lawsuits. And so now we have, uh, and and people should understand that this applies also not just to consumer contracts but also to employee contracts. Uh, and, and and so where where are we? We now, I mean, we, we have a situation where it seems to me that every uh, corporation in the country is going to put these uh, clauses into their contracts. And in very few circumstances, when you're talking about corporation to consumer and corporation to employee, uh, the employee and the consumer, the individual is just not going to have the bargaining power to eliminate these uh, clauses. That's exactly right, and I think you know some of the biggest harms we see are in that relation are in the contracts between companies and uh, employees, and you know th this is something that's being used across the board. I mean, Goldman Sachs is including this in its contracts with workers. Uh, we're seeing Uber include it. We're seeing Pia Chang. You know, so it's really corporations across the spectrum. Um, and it was interesting, you know, in the days after these decisions, both the AT&T and American Express case, you saw law firms around the country blast out these advisories to their corporate clients that was basically saying, it's time for you guys to change the fine print. You know, before then, a lot of states had had these class action bans, and after these cases, it was clear that corporations could get away with with inserting them. Um, so it was really interesting to just go read those memos that were basically saying to corporations, "Hey, you know, there's a perfect way for you to just insulate yourselves from the potential of litigation. So you guys should you guys should use it." We should also say that the uh, a lot of these arbitration outfits, particularly when you're dealing with not a business to business situation where you're looking at sort of one offs between a consumer and employee and a business that these arbitration uh, outfits have a, um, I, I guess, a, a, a very, uh, they have sort of misaligned incentives here uh, in terms of how they rule. And in some instances, they have the ability to rule whether or not they should be arbitrating in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest differences between an arbitrator and a public judge is who pays for them. So judges are paid from public taxes that we all pay. Arbitrators are paid by the people retaining them, uh, which oftentimes end up being the company that is choosing the arbitrator in the first place. So just at a very basic level, the incentives look very different for an arbitrator. And there have been cases and studies that find that, you know, arbitrators end up being biased. Um, not all arbitrators are like that. I mean, you know, some of the biggest companies doing arbitration nowadays, um, AAA and, and JAMS, are considered to be more fair in that regard. But it's, it's definitely, you know, a big difference. And there was a, a big case um, that uh, the Attorney General of Minnesota brought that was basically, yeah, finding that, you know, some of the biggest arbitrators were just routinely siding with companies because of their financial incentive. Right. I mean, it's sort of the um, uh, the, the analogy I would draw is those rating agencies, um you know, you can decide which rating agency, if you're a, if you're an investment bank, you're going to try and uh, grade your securities and you're just not going to go back to the one that uh, doesn't give you the triple A, right? Yep. That's a, I mean, that's a perfect analogy for what's going on here in terms of incentives. So what can we do about this? Because I, 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 this seems to be I think I feel like we're just on the cusp of seeing the implications of this, that it's only going to get worse, that more companies are going to be uh, finding that this is a great way for them to uh, to mitigate any potential downside to uh, things like abusing employees, abusing consumers, uh, using abusing their monopoly power. What uh, what 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 can we do? 
So basically all falls to Congress at this point for the most part. I mean, you know, the CFPB is doing a study right now, and they have some ability to restrict how arbitration clauses are used in financial contracts. But when it comes to things like, you know, employment, consumer, um, kind of civil rights cases, it basically is going to come down to Congress. Um, there have been some instances in which they've, you know, included a little writer here or a little writer in that bill limiting how arbitration can be used, say, against, you know, former surf service members or, you know, um, so in isolated instances, it's something that Congress had tried to address, but we're really not seeing the kind of attention that it deserves. Um, uh, Al Franken and Hank Johnson have reintroduced something called the Arbitration Fairness Act, which would prohibit mandatory arbitration in employment, in consumer and civil rights cases, and antitrust disputes, and would really try and basically, you know, re restore how arbitration was initially conceived. Um, but we really haven't seen any any action or any widespread support for that in Congress right now. I mean, I think, you know, uh, this is one of those areas where uh, people are just not sensitive to the implications of, of something like the Supreme Court makeup uh, for something like this. Now, I mean, granted, um, uh, the, the door was opened by the Warren Court, whatever it was, uh, 30 years ago now, I guess. But uh, it has really been sort of, I guess, the, I mean, the door's been taken off the hinges and the, the wall's been blown out now by this five to four majority. This seems to me to be like one of those perfect examples of why the Supreme Court is important in ways that I think most Americans have absolutely no consci consciousness of. Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things, you know, so far, most of this has been framed as a question of, you know, do Americans sue too much or do they not sue too much? You know, there's this huge meme around frivolous litigation. But this, at the end of the day, this isn't really about whether we can all get our $30 back from, you know, a company screwing us over once in a while. The stakes are much, much bigger. It's basically about whether, whether laws get enforced, whether the laws that Congress, whether our elected leaders, the laws that they're passing, whether corporations have to abide by them. Um, so, you know, it's a much bigger question than just whether, you know, we can get some money back from a corporation. It's, it's really about the rule of law and whether, you know, really essential laws like minimum wage, you know, bans on racial discrimination, checks on monopolies, these huge laws, whether they get enforced or not. Lena Khan of the uh, New America Foundation, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. All right, folks. We will, of course, uh, put a link up at uh, Majority FM to uh, so you can read the piece. But, you know, this is the type of stuff that um, I think is, is just so under the radar and is so important. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, you know, I know that's a little, uh, little bit weedy, but that stuff is, I think, just uh, just crucially important. And that's... That's why we do this show. <laughs>